encourage you to do so. Well, welcome everybody to Pre-Health Shadowing. My name is Nina and I am the founder and CEO of Pre-Health Shadowing and I'm really excited to welcome you back for another virtual shadowing session. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led nonprofit organization focused on creating flexible and accessible opportunities for pre-health students during the ongoing pandemic. So thank you everybody again for joining uh, and supporting our organization. We do have closed captioning to accommodate students of all abilities and needs. If you have any ideas about how we can be more accessible, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Additionally, if you're interested in getting more shadowing hours with our program, we do have virtual shadowing sessions scheduled through the summertime. So be sure to sign up for our email list on the website. Uh, just a little tip, if you want to actually make sure that you see those emails, uh, I encourage you to save pre-health shadowing as a contact in your email. Um, this will make sure that you skip the junk folder, the spam folder, and the promotions folder, and it'll go straight to your inbox where you can view it uh, and shine, shine up for our sessions. If you want to stay in the loop, you can join our email list um, as well as follow us on social media. We are active on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. So uh, at Prehealth Shadowing is our link. Since we are an international program hosting students from all over the world, I'm curious, where are you calling from today? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. I am personally calling from Southern California in the US. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. So. Since Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led nonprofit, um, and you are most likely students, um, if you're interested in joining the Pre-Health Shadowing team, we do have opportunities open for you. We are opening internships for the summer of uh, 2022, so this upcoming summer, as well as volunteering opportunities. So uh, check out our website. You can sign up for free on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash volunteer. You can check out, we have so many different projects going on. Uh, that really stem through all interests. Um, so in regards to the leadership roles, um, this is what our application looks like. If you have any passions in technology, research for grants, fundraising, organization, research program, video productions, media, art, um, supporting diversity and inclusion initiatives, we have all of these opportunities um, for our students. And so definitely check it out. If you have any questions about this, feel free to email us at recruitment at um, prehealthshadowing.com. Additionally, if you're a high school student, we do have a high school program titled HTP. HTP is uh, working to establish pre-health shadowing as a club on various campuses around the US. So if you're interested in establishing a club on your high school campus or helping other students establish clubs on their campuses, definitely uh, I'd encourage you to apply. This is a wonderful opportunity um, to support students looking to learn more about healthcare. Additionally, if you're looking to get published, we are featuring students of the Pre-Health Shadowing community on the official Pre-Health Shadowing website. This is your opportunity to get published. Um, you can publish articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories. Um, of course, Pre-Health Shadowing focused. If you have a uh, reflection or a review of a shadowing session, if you have a success story about how Pre-Health Shadowing has impacted you on your journey, or an article about why pre-health shadowing is important. We would love to hear it. As I mentioned, everyone is a volunteer within our organization, including myself, uh, and we are working day and night to keep this program up and afloat to create opportunities for all students everywhere. We humbly ask uh, you to scan this QR code today. Uh, that'll lead you to our donation page where you can uh, contribute to our mission of fighting inequity in health education and promoting diversity in the various healthcare fields. If you're financially unable to donate at this time, we do encourage you to send this to your friends, families, and members of your community uh, to help us support our organization and to keep these opportunities free for everyone, always. Thank you, everybody. Throughout the duration of the shadowing session today, I encourage you to type your questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to type all of the questions that you have during the Q&A portion today. Natalie and our co-host will be asking them 
So this is your opportunity is one of the perks about joining the live session is you get to ask your questions to our professional. So I encourage you to utilize that benefit. Please take good notes because if you are interested in earning a digital certificate that verifies your hours in our program, you will be taking a post shadowing assessment, which is a 10 question quiz that shows that you were paying attention and actively participating throughout the session. So be sure to take notes um, and you'll have two tries, 10 questions, 30 minutes. Uh, if you are on the website, uh, please do not start the quiz before the session is over because there will be nothing there for you um, and you will not be able to go back. So please, 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 if you're interested in getting the certificate, wait until the end of the session to do so. Otherwise, you may not be able to do that. Additionally, please turn your cameras on. Uh, it's really, really great uh, to have these virtual shouting sessions and it's even better to see the amazing faces that are benefiting from these sessions. And so um, please, if you're able to at this time, I encourage you to turn your cameras on, um, give us a little hello. Of course, not mandatory, but we do appreciate it. Without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome to you our professional for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Cynthia Hurd. I muted myself, sorry. <laughs> um, like I was telling Nina a little earlier, um, I'm having some major sinus issues. <clears throat> Did I mute again? I'm having some major sinus issues because I went from Memphis to Nashville, to Memphis, to Jackson, Mississippi in like three days. And it's just been something else since I've been back in Memphis. And Memphis is a huge allergy place. So, if you come here and stay here for any length of time, uh, you've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start sharing my uh, presentation. Awesome, and I'll go ahead and shoot that poll out. So while you're sharing your screen, Dr. Hurd, students, if you can go ahead and answer the polling question, um, it'll ask you who you are, what you do, what you're interested in, and whether you've been here before. So we're interested in learning about that. Okay. All right, there we go. Is everything looking like it should, ladies? Yep, looks awesome, thank you. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Again, um, I'm Dr. Cynthia Hurd. Um, I'm an optometrist. I've been an optometrist for 30 years. In fact, um, this year is my 30th uh, reunion uh, at Ohio State when we go back in the fall. So that's gonna be a great time and I look forward to seeing my classmates. Some of them I haven't seen since we graduated. Now, let me tell you a little bit about me um, and some things that I've uh, encountered, just so you have a little bit of I, more of an idea uh, about uh, just me as an individual. So I lived in Jackson, Mississippi uh, from 1965 until I left to go to optometry school uh, at Ohio State. And you may ask, why did you decide to go 800 miles away from home? Because there are other optometry schools that are closer. Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I was able to accomplish my goal of becoming an optometrist. In fact, uh, I think I started thinking about optometry when I was about 16, 15 or 16, and it never changed. So not many young people can actually say that. Although I have a number of colleagues who have told me that they wanted to be an optometrist, some of them since they were like second and third grade. And I thought, who in the world knows that by the time you're seven or eight years old? But apparently <laughs> that, that's a thing. So I consider optometry to be my dream job. And I'm so pleased that I was able to go to school and, uh, and do the things that I had to do in order to accomplish this goal. The other thing I wanted to bring up is just a little bit of perspective. Um, I'm one of those people who listens to a lot of books on Audible, and there's just a number of things that are out there. I really started listening a lot after uh, the George Floyd incident, because there are so many books uh, about race, discrimination, uh, you name it, it's out there. And so I, I really um, 
appreciate being able to listen to those things because they have contributed to my perspective. For example, uh, the year I was born, which was actually March, 1965, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Malcolm X was assassinated in February of 1965, a month before I was born. That just trips me out. There are a lot of other things that happened, especially civil rights uh, things that happened uh, in 1965. I don't think the civil rights, um, the voting bill uh, had been, I think it had been passed, but I don't think it was initiated yet. So in telling you that, um, I was thinking not too long ago about the fact that my mom was 30 when I was born. And when, um, when I was born, she could not vote yet in the United States because she was a black woman living in Mississippi. And it took a lot of struggle uh, in order for black people to have franchisement. So uh, I remember being on social media and I mentioned it uh, to a friend and she was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sad that I don't even know that. I said, you know it now. So why don't we just move along together? So I, I just uh, find things like that to be um, very fascinating. One other book that I'm also listening to right now is a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's by a psychiatrist who is a specialist. He deals with uh, veterans who have PTSD. He also deals with children who have trauma um, anytime during their childhood. And just some of the things that he has uh, pointed out just really have opened my mind uh, to some of the things that I probably have witnessed and had no idea that that was why the individual behaved that way. So, so it's just really, really interesting. The Body Keeps the Score, that's the name of the book. Now, just to tell you a little bit about my uh, encounters and experiences. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about my family. Uh, I am the ninth child of 10 children. So I'm number nine. I have a younger sister who is number 10. So I have one younger sibling. That's a big deal to me. <laughs> but, um, but just so you know, these are, these are my siblings here. Actually, this is my cousin in the middle. <clears throat> and this was at her mother's funeral in 2009. And she is like a sister to all of us. So, so she was there appropriately uh, with me and my siblings. Uh, the next thing I wanted to point out is my colleagues. So the picture over here of Ohio State 1992 um, class, uh, College of Optometry, um, there were 56 people who, 57, sorry, who graduated in my class, um, including me. I'm right here in the little um, composite there. And I'm looking forward to, like I said, seeing my classmates that I haven't seen in such a long time. Um, and some of these individuals have uh, informed uh, some of the things that I, um, that I find important in optometry. But there's also been, <clears throat> of course, there's also been other colleagues that I've encountered since optometry school that have really impressed upon me um, some of the things that I found important, especially if there were things that resonated with me. And then uh, my last uh, little reference here is to my patients. So the doctor who, um, who wrote the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score, he said his patients are his most important uh, teachers. I totally agree with that. Uh, it's one of those things where if you listen to your patients, they teach you all sorts of things. For example, here, <clears throat> Larry Lippman, is um, a low vision patient of mine. He's wearing a contraption on his glasses called uh, a bioptic telescope. So the telescope allows him to look uh, out in the distance with his left eye so that he can see things uh, similar, to, uh, the similar to the vision level that uh, the rest of us can do with our regular glasses. So Larry was born, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as a, a high myope. Um, so, 
so it's it's really interesting um, when someone's born and they already are a myope um, because that's one thing that you know we hope never happens before the child hits like puberty. But in his situation, because he was born with this condition, his myopia increased and increased. Uh, it's more so in his right eye than his left eye. Um, and so he's had to wear glasses that have significant prescription in them. And his vision in the, the right eye is about 2080, best corrected. Vision in the left eye is about 2150, I wanna say. So even with best correction, he is not 2020. Now his telescope allows him to be 2040 in his left eye, which is his better eye. Um, and that meets the standard for Tennessee uh, so that he can drive uh, in the state with the telescope mounted to his spectacles. This is a huge deal because <clears throat> before this, I think Larry said he was about 29 years old. Before that, uh, he was not able to drive because he didn't have good enough vision. There was no bioptic program in Tennessee. Uh, then when he uh, read about the bioptic program, uh, he proceeded to be fit with the telescope uh, and he's been driving for about 30 years. So that's something that I really value for my patients because I want him to continue to be able to drive. He works full time. Um, and he's a consultant for a company where um, he does a lot of the technical support for the company. Uh, and sometimes he has to travel to his clients, whether it be getting in his car and driving around the corner or whether it be getting on a plane, then getting in a rental car and driving to where that patient or that individual is. So his life is pretty much like your life and my life. And that is amazing for someone who has low vision. So if you want to read a little bit more about Larry's journey, um, this is uh, a link on the American Optometric Association website, um, and it's under I Deserve More, uh, and it's talking about doctor and patient relationships. The thing that was interesting was we did not take this picture later when we decided to do, when we decided to submit this story. Larry actually asked me to take this picture with him on the day he was fit with the bioptic. And I thought that is so cool. So now we have a memorial of this event and we can share that information with other people. So Larry is a great friend of mine. He shares a lot of things with me that are important to him, especially by email or websites or links. And I do the same, although I have to say he does better than I do. Um, because life is kind of hard sometimes and busy. Now, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, um, this is me at 18, roughly. Um, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, like I said. I attended Lanier High School, um, which has been one of, the, um, one of the main high schools that African-Americans in Jackson um, graduated from. It has been around since, I wanna say 1933. So it's a really storied program. Um, um, almost all of my family members have graduated from there except my two oldest brothers um, because they went to a different high school uh, when they were at the age where, where they were allowed to go to high school. We all graduated from high school and kind of did our own things. And, um, and so, my sister, my younger sister and I are both doctors, but she is a PhD in American studies. So she, she had to do a lot more work to get that DR than I did. Let's just say that. <laughs> now, um, what I did after high school was, <clears throat> excuse me, was I decided uh, to go to a local college uh, called Jackson State University. And actually, because I was valedictorian of my high school class, I was um, uh, offered a full scholarship. And that was an important thing to me because um, I grew up in a household where there were a lot of us. Um, my mom and my aunts, they were the ones who raised us, um, didn't have a lot of money. 
So the only way I was going to go to college is if I had to borrow it, uh, get it through a grant or scholarship, <clears throat> or th those are probably the two main things. So, <clears throat> cause I couldn't afford to pay for it. And so that was something that, um, that I re really valued and, uh, and I was glad to have the opportunity. Now I say drive by college because when I went to college at uh, Jackson State, uh, I didn't spend much time on campus when I wasn't in classes or labs. Um, I was a very serious college student because it was important to me uh, to be able to get the grades and to learn the information I needed uh, in order to be able to compete with other individuals at the next level. Because remember, I already knew I wanted to be an optometrist before I even finished high school. Now I did take, uh, what, sorry, um, I did graduate in 1987 as salutatorian of my class. Um, and probably the funniest, probably the only story I have about that is the young lady who was valedictorian was a, I think she was a chemistry major. And we were both in the same, <clears throat> the same science uh, college. And, um, and so she got the award for that college and she got valedictorian. I was like, lady, you're in my way. But she deserved it because she, she graduated with a 4.0 and she was a track uh, athlete. And I thought, okay, I can't beat that on any day. I did decide to take a gap year uh, after college because I was really burnt out after college. Uh, and, you know, keeping up with the curriculum to get all my courses done so that I could graduate. <clears throat> I pretty much had no idea what I was gonna do. I'm sorry, where I was gonna go uh, after I finished college. So I decided, I would just take some time um, and decide which schools I wanted to interview at. So you can see my list here. I interviewed at UAB, which wasn't far away. It was my number one pick before I went there to interview. Um, I interviewed at OSU and I, I've given you some reasons here why I decided uh, to go to OSU because economically it actually made more sense uh, for me to live 800 miles away from my family, believe it or not. Indiana University, I really liked Indiana University. When I went there, they had more uh, minority students than any other program I had gone to. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when I got there, there was snow on the ground. And let me tell you this, growing up in Mississippi, there is no snow. We get ice about every 10 years that you know turns that that uh, causes all kinds of power outages and stuff but we don't get snow and i just looked at that and thought i'm going to have to think long and hard about coming here and it turns out that uh, i would not have been allowed to become a resident uh, of indiana uh, because i was a student and that and uh, they knew that was one thing that individuals would attempt to do so I would have had to pay out-of-state tuition the whole four years. When I went to um, University of Houston, <clears throat> I had good thoughts about Houston when I got in my car. My sister and I drove there. And I got there and the interstate system was like crazy bananas. I had no idea um, what the ramp system indicated because I'd never been to a city that had a ramp system like that. And we constantly got lost. And so when I finished my interview, I proceeded to tell my sister that if I can help it, I'm never coming back to Houston. And so I did it, but it was a really interesting experience. And I've had really great relationships with individuals, whether they were students, alumni, uh, and even administrators at uh, their school because it's a, it's a great program. And that's me when I, around the time I <clears throat> finished college. Now, when I did my optometry training, uh, of course I told you this was at Ohio State. And there's a couple of pictures here. There's one of me at the National Optometric Association conference around 2005. 
uh, which I think it was 2004, actually, uh, when I think back uh, as to when this picture was taken. I was president of the organization at that time. Uh, so the National Optometric Association was created in 1969 uh, by African-American optometrists and, and some uh, Hispanic optometrists um, who wanted to be able uh, to come together for a national meeting uh, and teach each other things. Um, and one thing that was uh, going on at that time, uh, the American Optometric Association uh, was willing uh, to recruit uh, minority doctors for their organization, but you had to go through your state affiliate. And there were many states who would not allow African-American optometrists to join their organization. So think about that. That's like the 1960s when that was happening. And so as a result of that, um, the individuals who, who uh, created in the NOA uh, did not want to pay their dues to the AOA and not be a part of their state affiliate and not get representation uh, as members. So uh, it was a big issue. Now in, um, I think 1979 was when the National uh, Optometric Student Association was created. And we have our, our meetings jointly, uh, usually in the summer of each year. Now, one thing that I absolutely discovered uh, going through my training uh, at Ohio State was I discovered vision rehabilitation and the ability to help patients use residual vision that they had. And to me, that was like the coolest thing. And when I went through my low vision rotation as a fourth year student, I absolutely loved it. In fact, I did it off campus at a place called the Central Ohio um, Vision Center. And it was a facility that not only had optometrists who specialized in, optoma, in uh, low vision, it also had um, occupational therapists, vocational uh, therapists, individuals who help people with blind um, rehabilitation. So it, there were a number of professionals who were assisting these individuals um, to help them maintain their independence so that they could continue to work if they needed to, and so that they could pursue other things if, uh, if they wanted to and needed to. Um, so I just love the whole idea of a team of individuals coming together and helping an individual uh, with whatever area was their little carve out. That was one thing that I really valued when I uh, did my residency at the University of Alabama. Uh, School of Optometry, it was the affiliate for the Birmingham VA Medical Center residency. So this residency included uh, blind and low vision care, geriatric vision, and I also went to the Tuscaloosa VA, <clears throat> excuse me, for four months out of that year uh, to do nursing home care. So using uh, instruments that were portable, uh, in order to examine patients. We did inpatient care uh, because some of the individuals were there because they may have had a heart attack or a stroke or something. And because they were there and needed eye care, we would see those individuals. And then some of them had urgent uh, issues that we would see. So I did get to treat some patients. And one thing I can say is that as an optometrist, I've never had uh, to go without being able to, um, to treat individuals with therapeutic drugs. Because that's something in 1992 was when, when Ohio actually got uh, the law passed for that, which was the year I graduated. And um, so before that, we only had uh, diagnostic privileges. So we could use drops to dilate the eye, to check the pressure in the eye because they were diagnostic procedures. And, uh, and we could not um, do things like treat a red eye, treat uh, eye allergies, uh, or even glaucoma. But as an optometrist, I've been able to do that my entire career. And that's really a blessing. 
The last picture here that I want to make a comment about is my husband and I actually went back to OSU around 2014, I think it was. And uh, I had to make sure we went to a game because my husband uh, is a big Ohio State fan, which I had no idea that was the case until I got to talking to him about it. So this is us in the horseshoe um, having a great time. We really, really enjoyed our experience. We look forward to going back this fall and having even more memories. <clears throat> now, after um, I left my residency, I did go back to Ohio State um, in 1993, and I became uh, a module manager, but that's a fancy title for a clinical instructor, which in a lot of the, um, in the settings where people teach, usually the, the young doctors who have done residencies, that's usually the job that you take uh, when you're in in a setting like that. I was also a consultant for a, a psychiatric facility for 13 years. Uh, I would take students there and we would see patients um, who were psychologically unstable or they were just having, um, maybe having lapses with reality and they ended up there as opposed to being put in jail. Uh, the only areas of practice that I haven't done our private practice, which is what most optometrists do. I haven't done military and I have not done industry, but I know a lot about those things because I've had colleagues who have pursued those things and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've, I have a lot of friends in industry too um, that have been kind enough to, um, to share things with me so that I can learn more about uh, what they do and how they can assist optometrists uh, manage our patients. Now, minority student recruitment, this is a big thing at every uh, school or college of optometry. It's a big thing everywhere. Now, the cool thing about uh, Dr. Welton, oops, sorry about that. He was the first African-American graduate of OSU College of Optometry in 1938. He was also the first African-American fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, which uh, is an organization that still exists today. They're gonna celebrate their centennial anniversary this fall. And, um, and I had no idea that he was the first African-American fellow until I was looking at some information online and I thought, oh my goodness, I think he's the first African-American fellow, which was awesome. I was glad to be able to make that discovery. And he's a Buckeye, so there we go. Uh, also, schools have started to uh, celebrate events like Juneteenth, um, which wasn't something that was even on the radar when I was a student. But now we acknowledge pretty much um, any events or, uh, um, or uh, awareness kinds of um, things so that people can um, at least be acknowledged because it's important for people to feel seen and heard. This is my husband and me at the NOA convention. The, um, the students also uh, convene at the same time uh, when the doctors do. Uh, we have our, um, uh, food events and things like that together. Uh, and in some of the, the speaker events, we also have together. And the students um, do get a lot of support either from their College of Optometry or uh, from scholarships directly from the NOA or the NOF, which is the foundation for the NOA, so that they can come to meetings and not feel um, that they had uh, to take a whole lot out of pocket to be able to go, which is great. Within the last two to three years, I'm gonna say, there's actually an organization called uh, Spectrum. Uh, this organization within the optometry programs uh, is concerned about LGBTQ um, plus issues. And this was an organization that wasn't on the radar, um, like I said, until a few years ago. 
So it is a place for um, faculty, staff, and students um, to come together and, um, and do things that maybe they wouldn't have an opportunity to do uh, as a group. Now, this is me. This is a pretty typical thing. This is me taking um, photos of children's eyes, of their fundus. <coughs> and so whenever we had a, um, take a, a take a child to work day, take a daughter to work day, this one is called uh, Shadow a Student. So um, they would come to the college. We would have a few different activities for them to participate in. And I usually man the camera, the fundus camera. So I would take a picture of their eye. I would put their name, which I was, and the date. And, uh, and then I would just kind of stand around and see how they react to seeing a picture of their eye. You know, some of them called it really gross because it does look gross. Um, and then some of them thought it was beautiful, kind of like me, um, because the optic nerve, the vessels, um, when everything is functioning like it's supposed to be, it is uh, quite a wonder. Now, one other thing that I want you to be aware of is most schools and colleges um, in the U.S. do have summer enrichment programs. Some of them, uh, they actually pay you to be a part of them. There aren't that many of those. Um, for example, uh, here at SEO, we do have two programs uh, that are short programs, but, you know, we hope that they are, you know, somewhat impactful, especially to the kids who are local. So we have um, Eyes on Success, um, and we have a Success in Sight. These programs are for high school and uh, undergraduate college students. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's usually, before COVID came, it was usually a, a three-day program where they would come in and we would work with them uh, and let them dissect cow's eyes and let them play with prisms and glasses um, and, and do like a, um, like a bag toss. And so what would happen with the prism is it would basically convert all of your, what you were looking at like to one side or up or down. And then we would let them throw or toss a bag and before their brain could actually adapt to it, they were throwing it way off somewhere. Uh, and they were like, wow, what just happened? And to be honest, the brain is very good at acclimating because within about 10 minutes of wearing those, those individuals can actually toss a, uh, the little bean bag into a hole or into a bucket, which is kind of crazy. But that's our visual system. It is phenomenal. Now, <clears throat> as far as um, the Ohio State uh, Optometry Services, um, within the last, I would say four years, they have actually created uh, a new eye clinic on Ohio State campus. It is now on Neal Avenue when it used to be on um, 10th Avenue. The whole time I was a student and that I worked there, um, it was on uh, 10th Avenue. So the picture in the middle is, <clears throat> is the uh, entrance to the optometry services uh, where our eyewear gallery uh, was, as well as uh, our exam rooms uh, for our clinical care. One other thing that we had uh, put on the, uh, the wall there was uh, something called Cool Brutus uh, Buckeye because he's wearing glasses. So we think that's really cool. And I wanted to show you this because this is how uh, kind of crazy I am when it comes to eyeball stuff. When I was leaving in um, the summer of uh, 2007, we had a lady on staff who actually was a, she was like a professional cake maker. So I asked her if she could make my cake for this event and you see what happened here. <laughs> I love this picture and the cake was so good. Each layer was a different flavor. Can't beat that. 
So some things that will always be a part of my life is going to be doing things that Buckeyes do, like O-H-I-O. These are two different times when I was a part of uh, uh, this process. This was at Graceland Mansion here in Memphis. Two of my friends actually came to visit me after I uh, left there. And so we had to um, solicit a security guy uh, to do one of the letters for us, but it was such a great time. Plus it was at Graceland, you know, Elvis's home. Then more recently, there were, um, whoa, there were several of us who actually either went to optometry school there or uh, were graduate students at Ohio State. And so we had to do the old OHIO at a faculty retreat. Um, I think there were some people who were a little salty about it, but that's not my problem. Now, I moved to um, Memphis in August of 2007. Um, And so we have uh, two main buildings on our campus. Well, actually three, but two of them I'm gonna talk about. We have uh, the tower, which is where our classes and lab spaces are located. And pretty much everything else. We have a diner on the fourth floor. Um, uh, Doctors uh, offices are throughout um, the tower. And uh, we have a campus store. Uh, Because uh, SCO is an independent uh, school of optometry, we pretty much have to have all the things on campus that other schools uh, might have access to because they are on a bigger campus, like what was the case at Ohio State. Um, I just want to share a picture with you of some of the students and me. We were at a, a NOSA a vision screening. This was probably around 2015. And this is pretty routine. We, uh, we try and do at least one screening per semester. We may even be able to get in um, a few more. This is a perk for the student uh, members. They can um, participate in the screenings. They they get first dibs. Um, And we can educate patients about eye issues. Now, this picture on the right is one of me uh, being interviewed by someone from the local local media, from one of the um, local channels. so about every year, although we had to uh, we had to uh, delay it for at least a couple of years because of COVID, but we uh, when we have a sight savers uh, training, what happens is uh, we identify school age children who could benefit from having an electronic uh, magnifier, something like a CCTV is what they're called. And these instruments uh, have a lot of different functions to them and it can make a huge difference in a child's life uh, while they're in school. So sight savers, not only, um, uh, they actually identify children as well. We had, our most recent event was about three weeks ago and uh, we had 14 children that came in for uh, training and So the training entails showing them how to use the instrument, making sure that they can write under it um, and making sure that they know what the controls are uh, and uh, make sure they can get home and set it up. Most instruments now are like one big unit that are connected to each other, uh, parts connected. So it's really easy to take an, uh, an instrument home now and plug it into an outlet and you're ready to go, which is great. And I love helping students uh, at those ages. It really can make a difference in their lives. One other thing I didn't mention is the eye center. Our eye center is one of the largest eye centers in the country, believe it or not. We have about 400 uh, eye appointments per day. You heard me, per day. And uh, we have I think seven different clinics uh, at the eye center. So we do everything from basic primary care uh, up to removing lumps and bumps from the eyelid. 
And uh, in Tennessee, we don't have privileges uh, to use lasers on the eye, but that's probably something that's going to uh, be fought for uh, in the near future because the states around us have privileges to use lasers like Kentucky, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana. So, so we're, we're probably gonna uh, try and get that privilege so that optometrists who want to do that care can do that care. Now, Memphis, for those of you who have been to other parts of Tennessee, um, once you've been there, you have not been to Memphis though. Memphis has its own vibe. Uh, it's an area where uh, the blues is really big here because a lot of uh, musicians and singers that came from plantations and um, uh, in sharecropping situations in Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, they would come to Memphis um, to try and make another way or make another kind of living for themselves as musicians. And many of them travel back and forth uh, between Memphis and um, Chicago. So there was a lot of sharing of music and, and concepts uh, among those musicians. Now, this is one of my favorite pictures at work, me and the Grizz. This was on Halloween in 2012. And I'm sure you're like, okay, thank you. But <clears throat> I think this is the only time I've seen the Grizz actually come through the clinic. And everybody was really excited, especially the kids that were there that day. And we had candy buckets everywhere in the clinic. So it was a wonderful time for everyone, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can see, I was really enjoying myself. One thing that my husband and I were able to do uh, once we got here, it was, a, it was a few years later, we got to do a Segway tour downtown. The thing that was interesting about that was um, I had actually bought a walking tour with a Groupon. And when we got to the site, the individual who was providing the tour said, oh, we're, we're doing segways or we're using segways. And my husband and I are like, uh, we don't know how to use segways. So they did a real quick tutorial and showed us how to uh, control it. And you can see there, we were at least able to uh, stay upright. And in the background is a great picture of the river over the Mississippi. So it was a wonderful time. That was probably the most fun thing we have done since we've been in Memphis. And it was all by accident. This last picture is one of, um, a, is a, a drawing one of my students gave me back in around 2018. And I had no idea she was gonna give this to me. I think she, get, she sent it for Christmas. And you can see she had it personalized with my name. She also has Southern College of Optometry Low Vision which Low Vision Clinic was the one that she and I uh, saw patients together in. And I told her that I really liked um, my picture. It's hanging in my office today in a frame. And uh, this Dr. Hurd is, is really hot. So uh, I was okay with that. Now, that pretty much concludes my uh, presentation. Um, you can see here uh, what my contacts are. Um, if you want to get a hold of me by email, uh, by phone, or you can go to our website and, and look at things uh, around the eye center, which can connect you to the SEO website if that's something that you're interested in looking at. So I'm going to stop sharing, maybe. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I learned a ton and I'm sure that everyone else did as well. I'm just going to throw a plug in here for all our students who are watching. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. And with that, I will get started with our Q&A portion. 
Our first question is, can you speak to the medical biases hindering your profession in any way? How do you go about dismantling these biases in favor of sound truth? That's a really tough issue because uh, biases um, are something many times that are unconscious and, and professionals have no idea that they're actually uh, showing bias. That is something that I'm very uh, diligent about, even as a, a consumer of healthcare. Being a woman and being an African-American woman, I make sure that I see doctors um, that can empathize with me. So that means I fired all my male doctors. I'm kidding. And, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. And I, I work with people that, um, that I feel real comfortable with. And I have a ton of doctors now, like when you get into your late fifties, I mean, they're just doing stuff just to be doing it. And um, unfortunately it, it just takes a uh, continued education. I'm not really sure what it's gonna take because medicine has been looking at this forever. So has nursing. Um, and there's a lot of research about it. Um, and there's just no really good solution. One thing I do try and, um, and educate my patients on is to be their own healthcare advocate. And if they don't feel comfortable with the care they're being provided, fire that doctor. I say it just like that. And I think that can make a difference because it empowers the patient to kind of take control of uh, what's going on with them medically. And that's, that's the best answer I can come up with because it's difficult. Well, it was a great one. Our next one is, what does a day in your life look like? It depends on the day of the week. Being uh, an educator, um, I might spend most of my day in the clinical setting, but let me just tell you about a day when I'm in clinic mostly. So typically I'm in clinic um, in low vision clinic on Monday mornings um, at eight o'clock. And that's just cruel and unusual punishment, but you know, we, we just get through. And, um, and so the students, I usually have either four or five interns. They are fourth years. So these are individuals who are going to graduate the following spring. They have already had all of their coursework so during their fourth year, all they're doing is patient care. So they're seeing patients in the different clinics. And uh, when they come to Low Vision, I am one of three doctors that will be their instructor. Uh, we see patients in that setting for about four to four and a half hours. So um, we can also see children too. So the youngest patient I've ever had in Low Vision was probably four years old and they're so precious. I love them. I love them the moment I see them. And that's the one thing that I, I try and make sure that the parent is educated and, and I want the parent to feel uh, empowered to be an advocate for their child because that's extremely important, especially to get accommodations, reasonable accommodations in school and in other settings, uh, you know, if the child needs them. Uh, now, when in the afternoon, well, I eat my lunch in like 10 minutes. I'm usually running between things. And a lot of times I bring my lunch on days when I know I'm going to be in clinic a lot. And that has not changed since the first day I started teaching, which is crazy. And so usually I work with third year students in the afternoon in our primary care clinic. Um, I usually work with four interns there. We're in a suite where I think we have like six or seven suites where it's third year students. So we have a lot of third years in our clinic at one time. And um, it may be called our primary care clinic, but we see a lot of disease there. We see a lot of patients with cataracts. I'm talking about to the point of removal. They need a removal yesterday. Uh, we see people with diabetic retinopathy. We see people with end-stage glaucoma, which is horrible because you don't want to tell them that you got here too late. And, you know, they may think, well, can't glasses help? And I'm like, 
no. It's, it's such a sad thing. But at least I can educate them about low vision because at least I don't say to them, there's nothing else we can do, which that is like the worst thing you can say to a patient who is looking for hope. And then I get home about 7, 7.30 and um, I go to bed and get up the next day and do it all over again. <laughs> but it's awesome. I love the students. Seems very busy, but also very rewarding at the same time. Yes. And then another student asked, you said that you knew early on that you wanted to be an optometrist. What influenced you to go into this specific field of study? Well, uh, some of it had to do with my first eye exam. I was 13 years old when I had my first eye exam and I needed glasses. So I was what I would call a baby myope. So I only had a little prescription, but it made a big difference for my distance vision. And um, so I went to the optometrist and it's like, it was like I had an out of body experience. That's the only way I can describe it. Because the doctor was talking to me. He was asking me questions. He was doing these different tests. I had never been to a doctor who interacted with me and not my parent or somebody else in the room, uh, which was really different. And depending on the answers I gave him, I was going to get a pair of glasses based on my responses. So that was another thing that was really interesting to me. So I went home with my 13 year old self and I didn't think much more about it until people started asking me around the time I was 15. So what are you going to do up, do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be an optometrist. And they're like, well, you know, you got plenty of time to think about it. And I said, yeah, but I'm going to be an optometrist. And they're like, okay. And uh, the thing that was really funny, I went to my high school 30th class reunion back in, I think it was 2013. So the one thing I can say to all my classmates is I became an optometrist, <laughs> which is awesome. And, and it just kind of stuck with me. Thank you. And then we have Emma asking, what is your favorite case to see slash type of optometry patient and least favorite? <clears throat> Probably my, my favorite patient to see is someone who comes in and they don't have correction and the correction could have a huge impact on their life. Um, so they could either be a hyperop or myope or an asigmat. Sometimes we have people who come in for the first time um, in their 50s, first eye exam. And I'm like, what the? But that's how it is in, in Memphis sometimes. And, um, and the students do such a good job with those patients. They educate them thoroughly and they make sure the patient knows what's going on through the, throughout the exam. Um, so those, I think those are very rewarding cases because the patient, they can't thank you enough when they get ready to leave. The hardest cases, and I already talked to you about this, the hardest part of my job is uh, dealing with patients who have vision loss that can't be repaired. And it's really unfortunate. Um, and sometimes I'm the first person telling them that their vision is not coming back. We call those difficult conversations and they're difficult for a reason. Um, and so, you know, you try and make sure that the patient doesn't check out because they can, especially when you say your vision's not coming back, they don't hear anything else after that. I don't care what you're saying. You could tell them they want a million dollars. They're not hearing it. And, uh, and so hopefully someone's there with them who can also take in the information and, um, and again, like I said, I tell those individuals that we do have resources for individuals who have lost their vision and that there, that there is something else we can do. Because like I said, other doctors will tell them, I can't do anything else. I love to hear that you give them alternatives and resources and you're not just like, mm, sorry, can't help you. I know, I know. That would be so unfair. That would be unfair. 
And then we have Nina asking, what is the most common thing you see in clinic? And what is the most interesting thing you see in clinic? Let me see. I'm gonna talk about eye disease specifically. Um, or actually medical conditions. We see um, more patients with high blood pressure uh, and, and many times diabetes, um, even though they might be 25 years old or 22, I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's just amazing to me, the burden of disease on these individuals. And so that's something that we really try and educate them about, especially for them to understand that they need to come back every every year. And coming back to for the eye, eye exam has nothing to do with their vision or their glasses, because that's like what they think. Uh, and I tell them that, well, your prescription may not change the next time you come back. And if it doesn't, then you don't have to update your glasses. But we need to be monitoring your eye health to make sure that no blood vessels are leaking and that there's not things going on that could become irreparable. That's the one thing I tell them. And I also describe to them what happens to the blood vessels uh, as they develop uh, high blood pressure and diabetes. It can be a really sad thing uh, for individuals to lose their vision. Uh, from those conditions, because a lot of times they can't get it back or they can get some of it back and then they end up either in low vision or luckily they, they have one eye that's still good. It's a really crazy road. Another student asked how you chose optometry over ophthalmology. Well, um, I don't think that was a hard thing for me to decide. Um, I can remember being in college and, you know, we didn't have uh, the internet and Google and all that. So you had to reach out to the programs that you um, were interested in so that they can mail you information. So, so that was something that I did. I wasn't really aware of summer enrichment programs yet because there were, were some out there. I just didn't know about them. And I was not really interested in going to medical school. I knew that I wanted to be able uh, to help people. Um, and, and I always tell students uh, if they're interested in health professions, I say to them, I think things that are, are of great importance if you're interested in healthcare, um, you need to be good in math and science. You can't bomb those courses. Uh, you need to be a relatively good speaker, especially one-on-one. -on -one. It's okay if you don't do well in front of crowds because most of the time it's only you and the patient or you and the patient and a family member. Um, and you need to have a desire to wanna help people. Those are like the things that I think are absolute requirements. very advice. Earlier, you mentioned after college, you had experienced some burnout. I know burnout's a very popular topic right now. Do you have any advice for students or potential professionals who are experiencing burnout? I tell you, um, that gap year was the answer for me because it helped me to have time to regroup uh, and investigate the programs that I, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was interested in uh, uh, going to interview there um, because I may have, I can't remember if I applied to more than four programs, but there was the four that I interviewed at. And it was important for me to go to the place and interview. That was something that, that was like non-negotiable. Um, so, so that was important. Um, and what, what else were you asking me about? Just want to make sure I'm staying on topic. Oh, you're totally fine. I was just asking like advice for if you experience burnout, you know, burnout. how to combat right. it. Um, sometimes you just have to have a little time um, and you have to have a little conversation with yourself. <laughs> and, and, um, and 
and just decide, okay, what is it that I want to do next? Um, and once you decide what you want to do next and you move forward uh, toward that thing, uh, as long as you're doing some work toward whatever it is your goal is, then I think your mind can stay happy uh, with what you're doing. Uh, because you're eventually going to achieve, you know, the thing if you stay with it. So I think it really helped me to be ready for optometry school um, when I took the gap year. That's great advice. Um, some more questions about advice. How do you manage like having school and like your professional work and then relations or extracurriculars? say the first year, um, and a lot of students will, will echo this, the first year I thought was the hardest year. And let me tell you why. Jackson State was a predominantly Black college. Um, and I had actually gone to all uh, Black schools in the school system in, in Jackson. Um, I did not have anything beyond chemistry in high school. And so, and, and I didn't have any AP courses. So when I, you know, got through college and, and on to optometry school, there was a lot of catch up I had to do. And uh, I thank God I had the mind to be able to do it. I was just talking to my sister last week about that. I was like, wow, I felt so far behind, but I didn't feel so far behind that, that it was insurmountable because it, it was surmountable. And, um, and so I, I, Proved that I could um, could work hard enough uh, to accomplish what I wanted. Very great. Okay. And then, how has your career or your field of medicine changed in the years you've been practicing? Um, in the years I've been practicing, now there are I think it's eight states that can use lasers. Uh, to treat eye conditions, mostly anterior segment stuff, um, like glaucoma procedures, or removing the um, the capsule, uh, the back of the capsule uh, from an implant once the person's had surgery. So, um, so that's been a major accomplishment. In I want to say 1995, Oklahoma was uh, the first and only state for probably 20 years that had um, privileges to use lasers. So they're the granddaddies because everybody else came along later like Kentucky, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas has probably been within the last three to four years. Mississippi just got their law um, last year or the year before. And, um, and then there's a state out west, I think it's Utah, where they have, I'm sorry, it's Alaska, Alaska. Um, so uh, it's just a matter of time before everybody has it, or at least most of us have it. Do you oh, know why there's, oh, sorry, go for it. Um, I just want to say a little bit more about um, how the profession is different. When... <clears throat> when I uh, first started out, although this is something I don't have to deal with personally because I don't have my own practice, but dealing with insurance and making sure that you're submitting claims correctly so that you can get reimbursed, that's a really big deal uh, for doctors. One thing that I have started observing, and I've been observing this for probably 10 to 15 years, optometrists have decided, many of them, have decided to drop the vision insurance plans. And that might hurt them initially, especially if the patient wants to come back to them and you tell them, I don't take your plan anymore. Because one thing that was happening was the insurance plan was driving patients to the doctor, but the reimbursement was so low that the doctor couldn't even... Um, couldn't even earn what their chair cost was for the time that they saw the patient. So what's the point? You're, it's like you're working for that piddly uh, reimbursement, 
Uh, but, and then patients are kind of, how do I say this? Patients think insurance covers everything, but we know that's not true. And when you try to explain to them that they are going to have to pay out of pocket for something, um, then they either turn it down without even thinking about it. It's like you almost have to have a script ready to tell them why they need to have this done. Especially for someone who is potentially going to lose their vision if they don't do it. I mean, that, that's a huge thing. Um, so optometrists have gotten to the point where they're fed up with insurance and they've decided to walk away, which is interesting, very interesting. And the ones who have walked away, because, <clears throat> you know, we have different, um, uh, different group sites on social media, the ones who have walked away from insurance are happier. They say the first year or two, it, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, would that patient come back to see you or them? Uh, and eventually, if those patients really liked the care they got, they came back even without their insurance being taken. So that proves to us that, you know, patients uh, will go along, especially if uh, they feel like you've bonded with them sufficiently. And they know that, okay, Dr. Hurd is going to give me the care that I really need. Do you think if enough organizations drop insurance, it's going to send a message to insurance companies? Yes. You mean practitioners? If enough practitioners drop insurance, then insurance is going to have to do a better job. They're going to have to reimburse uh, doctors at a level where you can at least cover your chair cost. Um, and I won't say like, like when it comes to vision insurance versus medical, because patients don't understand that they don't understand that their vision insurance covers one comprehensive eye exam, usually over a 12 month period and a pair of glasses or a, a set of contact lenses. Then when you start talking to them about medical stuff, you say, well, your medical insurance can cover this. And they're like, what? So it's really interesting. The fact that we uh, can use um, two different insurances, depending on what the emphasis of that visit is, that's really confusing until you just have to make sure you explain it to them. And then when you were speaking about lasers earlier, someone asked why there are so many restrictions on them. Uh, well, our biggest... Uh, opponent is ophthalmology. They, they don't want optometrists to have any um, privileges to do any kind of surgical procedures, <coughs> excuse me, including laser. Um, and they will fight tooth and nail. Um, like like if, some, if, if one of our state associations um, goes to the state house, because everything we do has to be voted on by the legislation in the state. So they will sometimes, um, you know, mount an offensive that we can't overcome. And they'll, they'll, it's really interesting. They'll, they'll put out like bogus information talking about how we're not trained and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, wow. And, and the thing that was really surprising to me when I first started practicing is how little physicians knew that I could do. I'm like, I know what you can do. Why don't you know what I can do? And I was pretty unforgiving about that. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not just going to say, oh, well, you're just, you know, some goofy doctor. But I think it's important, not only you have to educate the doctor on how much, uh, how much training you have, and what you're actually able to manage. Because there's some things, there's a lot of things that we never send out. Uh, and they may even be to a place where they're potentially surgical in nature. But we have doctors competent enough in our clinic who can actually monitor these patients over months and sometimes over years. And if something happens where they need, where a referral is triggered, then it happens in a timely manner. So ophthalmology is, is the big bad wolf. 
keeping all the goods for themselves. It's it's a turf and, battle. It's a turf battle. They don't want to share that. That's for well, sure. They should they should go back to kindergarten and learn that sharing is caring. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's good. Um, our next question is: How do you handle difficult patients? Um, that's an interesting question because somebody was on, um, there's a, a women's OD group on, uh, Facebook. They got out of the OD, uh, Facebook, uh, group because they thought men were just, uh, uncouth <laughs> to deal with. That's all I can say about that. And so, so, uh, someone created a women's, um, optometry group. And so someone asked the question recently about, so what would you do if a patient came in and was yelling at your staff about this, that, or the other, and just really just kind of showed out in front of everybody. And so, you know, everybody was, you know, kind of dancing around the issue. And so I chimed in and said, I'd yell back at them. <laughs> she went, oh my God, I was waiting for somebody to say that. And the reason why I said that is because I have yelled at patients because sometimes there are things going on and you're like, what is wrong with you? I feel like I have a legitimate reason to yell at you or at least to be very stern and patients actually calm down. They calm down when you uh, show them that you are not going to cower to them and that you are gonna stand your ground. And then we end up being friends before they leave. <laughs> Enemies to best friends. I know, right? What qualities do you think would make either a good doctor, or an optometrist, or just someone who deals with patients? Good qualities. I think individuals who um, uh, who can show empathy because um, it does no good to show sympathy because you, you really can't do anything for the patient if you feel sorry for them or it'll come across that way um, and the patient may feel you know lower than what they were originally. But I think people need to show empathy I and mean, I think people need to show compassion. Compassion has been a big part of what I teach my students when, and I model this for them when we're in the clinical setting, because I think it's really important sometimes uh, to just step back and do something that the patient asks you to do, um, even if it's not a part of their exam. I run into this all the time in low vision clinics. They'll bring in documents and they'll be like, Dr. Hurd, can you look at this and da 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 and organize it for me? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. And then the student's like, okay, but they don't have anybody else to organize it for them. And uh, even though they may not be able to see well, some people don't trust other people. And they're like, I'm not letting anybody see my bank statement so that they know how much money I have in the bank. I mean, it's a really interesting issue. Um, what else? I think um, you just have to be willing, um, if you see something in a patient and you're like, wow, I don't know what the heck this is. You have to be willing to <clears throat> either refer the patient on so that it can be figured out or do your own research. And, and, uh, and then come to the uh, conclusion uh, that you might need to come to. Sometimes I'll do research and then I realize that, okay, this person needs to be referred. And it's usually not anything where their vision is, is any great, in any great danger. In fact, there, there's a patient right now that I actually need to call him. He has an interesting retinal condition, but I have no idea what to call it. I've never seen it. And I look through uh, websites and books and I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is. Uh, so, but we took photos of it and I actually want to refer him to one of our doctors who's a retinal specialist. She's an optometrist, 
but she's a medical optometrist. <coughs> so she basically manages patients, uh, retinal conditions, and if they have any issues with the vitreous, which is the gel in front of the retina, interacting with the retina. She probably hasn't refracted a patient since she graduated. That's not her job, which is very interesting because that was a really interesting thing that I ran across uh, when I first moved here because I didn't know any medical optometrists in Columbus. But I learned about like three of them right away when I moved here. It was just really interesting. And they do a really good job, a really good job. So on the lines of that, we have a student asking, does a medical optometrist have to attend med school or the four-year optometry school? Uh, four-year optometry school. Now, one thing that, that folks will do, especially if they think they want to really emphasize disease, they may do a residency, and then after that, they'll do a fellowship. So they do two years of additional training in a setting where there's a lot of eye disease and they get to manage those diseases with other people there with them uh, that they can uh, talk to about what to do. And then some doctors, like this one doctor, uh, well, she might've done a fellowship. There's this Dr. Haynes, um, she did a residency. And then I think she kind of did a fellowship in a retinal uh, practice where there was already one medical optometrist there and he kind of took her under his wing. And then she started, um, you know, doing mostly medical uh, retina and she's really good at it. I like her way more than him because <laughs> he, he's loud and obnoxious, but she's very kind. So that makes a difference. It does. Do you have anyone in your life you would consider a mentor? And do you have any advice on people looking to find a mentor or specific qualities that they should look for? Um, mentors are an interesting topic because there are people who have been in my life that were mentors to me where there was no intention for them to be a mentor when I encountered them. But I remember having... Um, a boss who was pretty much over uh, the whole clinical uh, program. He ended up being a mentor to me, um, as well as a woman who was, she was involved in the clinic administration, but she didn't end up staying. And, um, and I thought she was like the coolest optometry, optometrist I knew. And, uh, and so she ended up being a mentor to me also. Uh, um, and then, you know, along the way, different people become mentors um, because, I don't know, you see something in them or you see something that they've already uh, mastered that you're trying to master. So I don't usually say to them, well, you know, you need to be my mentor. What, what happens is I massage that relationship and then I learn for them, from them what I need to learn. And um, I did have one young lady who graduated like nine years ago, but she ended up coming on faculty at SEO. And then one day in the hallway, she just looked at me and said, you know, uh, I consider you my mentor. I just looked at her like, and what makes you say that? And it was, it was just interesting. It was one of those things that we, we bonded when she was a student. And so it wasn't like I didn't already know her. And and I said, okay, I will take on that role. And I did for a couple of years. And you don't necessarily need mentors for long periods of time, I think. You can have a mentor that helps you get through a project that you've never done before. Or someone who's just kind of there that you know you can bounce ideas off of them. So they end up becoming a mentor to you when you need them. So an intermittent mentor. <laughs> and you can ask them, you can ask the individual if they would mentor you. And most people will, which is great. Do you have any advice on how students should approach that? 
Um, if you are interested in an area where that doctor is re doing research, or if you know that they have a tendency um, to write their, um, their publications on certain conditions, and those are the conditions that you're really interested in, then those are the, per the individuals that you just need to pursue. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think doctors are okay with that. They are perfectly okay with that. It's just that, you know, there may be times when they're really busy and they don't really have time to take on an extra thing in their life. But six months from now, maybe they are ready. So, um, so I think most people, uh, instead of, you know, flat out telling you no, they'll say, well, I got too much going on. Check back with me in six months. And I would absolutely check back with them and see what's going on. That's great advice. And with this session coming to a close, is there any advice you would like to give the future healthcare workers? Future healthcare workers. I've pretty much talked about the things that, um, that I, I think are really good things to be focused on. Uh, you need to show compassion. Oh, one other thing that, that I also am very big on with my students is they need to be competent. They don't need to think they're competent or uh, believe they're confident. They need to be comp competent. And um, so working with them to make sure you work through um, issues in the clinical setting and listen to their uh, thought process and correct them if you need to, and then say, okay, yeah, I think you got that. So uh, compassion, competence, I, th I think those are, are really big things. Also, we all are going to have to uh, be a part of the process of, um, of trying to whittle down the issues with, um, uh, with bias, where patients get maltreated because of bias um, and uh, health discrimination. Um, if, if you're a person who, if you see something happening, then I would have to stand up for that patient. And if the next person doesn't like it, I'm like, that's really your problem. It is not mine. So I'm, I'm pretty vocal when it comes to things like that. And, um, and then when people know your position, they back off. I realize that sometimes people can be timid and they're not a they're not accustomed to doing that, but I'm accustomed to fighting for my turf. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hurd, for joining us today for the amazing presentation and for all of the insight that you provided to myself and my peers. Um, it's a wonderful honor and privilege to have you joining us. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you for creating this group or this uh, forum. I just wouldn't have known where to go or what to do first to create such a forum. Thank you so and much. I'm glad you did. Thank you. And for all of our students joining us here today, I'd like to invite you to uh, reflect on today's session. Uh, we've had a wonderful opportunity to gain insight from a professional who has worked in this field for many, many years. And so I want to ask you, what brought you to the session today? What are three major takeaways that you got from this? And what do you want to learn more about? Of course, you don't have to share this. This is for you and yourself. But if you are interested in sharing, we do have an opportunity for you to get featured on the Pre-Health Shadowing uh, official website. You can submit your reflection from today, a review of today's session, as well as your success stories uh, and articles. And so definitely, if you're interested, you can use this on your resume, CVs, applications, your LinkedIn profile. Um, so definitely uh, look into that if you have a passion for writing. Again, I mentioned if you're interested in being a part of the pre-health shadowing team, uh, we are recruiting for summer as well as the upcoming academic year. And so I encourage you to check out the website prehealthshadowing.com for our opportunities. We are opening up internship opportunities for the summer. So if you are interested, I encourage you to check it out. You can email us at recruitment at prehealthshouting.com if you have any questions about the positions. On the website, there are in-depth 
um, rural descriptions that is brand new. So definitely go and check that out. Again, I mentioned uh, our program is 100% free for all students to join, um, to gain insight, and uh, we are all volunteers here. And so if you could please uh, scan this QR code and help us keep this program afloat um, and keep opportunities available for students around the world for free, um, we would highly appreciate that. Of course, uh, we recognize this is not always possible. We are living through a global pandemic. So we do ask that if you are unable to donate at this time, if you could please share this link either on your social media or with members of your community. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for the certificate. So this is how you're gonna do it. You're gonna go to the website, prehealthshadowing.com where you can click on Dr. Hurd's profile page on our website. From there, you can enter the quiz, which is a 10 question quiz. You'll have 30 minutes and two tries to complete this quiz with a 70% or higher. Upon completion, you will receive a downloadable certificate that I recommend you download immediately to your device and you will have a verification of your hours. Um, one handy tip that one of our uh, pre hell shadowing community members has shared with us is that they have one document where they copy and paste all of their certificates and then they put their reflection underneath their certificate. This is helpful for individuals who may be applying to programs in the future, whether it's an optometry program, medical program, nursing program, PA program, you name it, you will be uh, reflecting on these opportunities. So I encourage you to do so. That is the tip of the day. Um, and if you missed any part of today's session, don't worry. We have all of our sessions, this one and all of the rest of them on our website and YouTube channel at Prehealth Shadowing. Be sure to check out our website. We have sessions every week um, and we are booked through the summer. So definitely check us out if you are interested in helping us recruit professionals. Uh, maybe you know someone, your family members, you know your uh, healthcare providers, uh, feel free to nominate them. You can shoot us an email or use the nomination form through our website and we will get in contact with them. That is all for today. I just want to thank everybody again for joining and shout out to Dr. Hurd. And if you have any questions about joining the team or anything about our organization, members of our team will stick around for a couple extra minutes. If not, this is the end of the virtual shouting session and I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. Bye everyone.